Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Good to have you here. And if you're visiting with us out on the tables in the lobby, there's a connection cards where you can let us know of your words of praise, your prayer requests, your needs, questions you may have. Uh, be sure to fill one of those out for us. And then also want to draw your attention to the Christmas boxes. There's a stack of them on the piano back there. They're due next Sunday. And we'll be looking at a video explaining more about it and how it's impacted people around the world. Let's pray, shall we? Dear Father, we thank you this day that we can gather here as sons and daughters of the King, those redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We thank you for your love for us. We pray the presence of your Spirit here, Father, to draw us closer to yourself through the songs of praise and thanksgiving, through the ministry of your word, through Pastor Rich. We commit this day to you because we love you and we know you love us. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Hello, my name is Kojo. I was raised in a family of nine in a very poor town, Ghana. We live in a playhouse. I remember going to school with no money, food, and I remember in grade four, 12 years old, I was in class when all of a sudden there was a loud noise. What we saw was Operation Christmas Child. They were in our school. We thought that Jesus loves you because the Bible tells you so. And after the message, they gave us a box. As soon as I got my box, I took my books, my bag, I just left to the house, ran home. And when I got home, I showed it to my family. And we opened it, and to my amazement, I had a yo-yo, toy car, pencils, and I just can't say how grateful I was. Whenever I wrote that yo-yo, I remember, Jesus loves me because the Bible tells me so. And what I would say is, thank you, thank you, as you are doing this ministry. It means a lot to me because the seed of God was sown in my life. And I'm here today because of the good work that you started for this ministry. And God has blessed me through that box. And I can't end without singing my song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little one to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, oh yes, Jesus, he loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Amen. I believe that, amen? Yeah. Amen. How many of you guys have been involved with Christmas Child in the past? Awesome. Yeah, if you guys haven't, I'd encourage you guys to either ask about it if you have questions or just grab a box. Um, it's got instructions in the box, correct? Yeah. yeah. So if you guys... Uh, haven't been involved, I encourage you guys. It is an incredible ministry, and it's obviously making an impact around the world. So it's a simple thing we can do, very low um, commitment level for us, and a very high impact for these guys and kids. So yeah, I encourage you guys with that today. So with that, let's stand, and we'll begin this uh, service with worship. Okay. 
So take me as you find me All my fears and failures I feel my life again I give my life to follow Everything I believe in Now Today. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen Amen. Amen. And I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch it.
last song we're going to sing this morning. It's called The Blessing. We've sang it a few times. Um, if you haven't learned it yet, that's okay. I um, encourage you guys to just uh, either listen to the words, just close your eyes and reflect. Um, but it is a song that's a little different than most worship songs. It's a song of a blessing over who you're singing it to. Um, so for us on stage, we're, we like to think we're singing this over you as the congregation. Um, and for you guys, I'd encourage you to think of someone uh, to sing this to this morning, someone that's dealing with pain, someone dealing with loss, or maybe it's a lost loved one, just anyone that needs encouragement or blessing in their life. And let's just sing this out to that person this morning. So let's sing.
specifically lift up anyone in this room that's, that's feeling pain, even singing these lyrics, that's feeling hurt or depression or sadness in any way, that you would just lift them up today. They would feel your presence in this room. They would feel met in a special way in this place. I pray you'd use us as a family to comfort and lift them up. And we do pray this blessing over everyone on our minds this morning. someone across the world. We just pray this blessing over your people today. We pray in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. And children, you guys are all dismissed for Kids Church as well. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, worship team. I know you all got the letter or heard, of course, that uh, Brandon and Emily at some point Brandon is stepping down from his position as worship and youth leader. Hopefully you got that information. Uh, he's pursuing his interest in EMT. Eventually firefighting is, is, is a strong desire. So we really want to bless him as he goes. I was thinking of him as we sang the song. Uh, his final Sunday officially here, kind of in flux. It's kind of fluid, to be honest with you. But we're looking at November 29th uh, and, and doing a celebration of some kind. I don't know what that's going to be. But some, some, we're going to do something. We're celebrating you leaving. No, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a part. Yeah. So uh, anyways, I, as I mentioned in the first service, I thought of different ways to try to keep him here, but every way I could think of was illegal. So um, <laughs> I can't do that. So we just want to bless him. Huh? You'll help. Okay. <laughs> we'll let Brandon, he'll be, he'll be locked in the basement of the church and let out on Sunday mornings. And uh, uh, <laughs> so, no, we want to bless him and Emily as they, as they go and just uh, thank him every opportunity you get because he's done great work here and a great ministry here. And so we just want to bless him every opportunity. And he's doing a ministry and what he's doing next. I don't know about you, but I think we need a lot of Christians and emergency medical tr technicians and aspiremen and everything else. So, so uh, be praying for them and blessing them and the weeks that we see them ahead as, as well as uh, for their, their future. Uh, having said that, let me pray for us and we'll get into the, the message. Father, I want to thank you for this morning and thank you for everyone who's here. I look out at this congregation, I see people who have been hurting one way or another. I see people who, who've had loss of jobs and I see people who've had recent medical issues and... Father, I just I do pray that you bless them. Pray that you bless us. I pray, Father, that no matter what the future holds, and we're hearing all sorts of things about what's going to happen in Oregon, what's going to happen in Washington, and shutdowns, and further this and further that, through it all, you're Lord, and we ask that you would lead us and that we would obey you and seek you and seek your face and do what you ask us to do. Uh, Father, we, we pray that you would be glorified in this service. We pray that you be glorified in this church body all of the time. We pray that you'd use us to be light in the darkness, and it's definitely a dark place right now, Father, and we know that. And so we, we ask for your help. We ask for your patience with us when we fail. We ask for forgiveness for one another when we fail one another. And we pray that we would be there as a fellowship that is strong and united and blesses your name. So be doing that work in us afresh. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A woman liked to go to the post office in her town because the postal employer, employees there were, were very friendly. She went there to buy stamps just before Christmas one year, and the lines were extremely long, as often happens at Christmas time. Someone pointed out there was no need to wait in line because there was a stamp machine in the lobby. I know, she said, but the machine won't ask me about my arthritis. You know, it feels good to know that someone truly cares about your well-being. Who cares about your spiritual well-being? Whose spiritual well-being do you care about? Who has God entrusted into your care for their spiritual well-being? And what difference does that make in your life, how you live your life? Last week, we, when we were in the book of 1 Thessalonians, we saw how Paul, Silas, and Timothy were thankful for the church in Thessalonica. This week we see that the Apostle Paul also cared deeply for this church body. Today we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17 to chapter 3, verse 5, and I invite you to turn there, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
Next time we're in 1 Thessalonians, we'll also look at 1 Thessalonians, just the part of chapter 3, verse 5, chapter 3, verse 1 to 5 of the same context, but from a slightly different angle. Next time we'll look at the personal cost of caring for and discipling others, and this week we're going to look at how the Apostle Paul demonstrated his care and concern when he couldn't be there in person, which really applies well for our situation. When he couldn't be there in person, when he was separated and, and he, he couldn't be there and he wanted to be there and the fellowship was being stopped, how did he respond? Again, we're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17 to verse 20 to begin with. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned, now I find it interesting that it isn't the church that he considers orphaned, it's the mission team and himself that he considers orphaned because they're away from the fellowship. When we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our own, our, our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did. It lets us know that Paul wrote the, wrote the letter. Again and again, but Satan blocked our way. He is giving Satan credit or maybe blame for keeping the fellowship apart. Satan's a very real person, and he acknowledges that. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes, when he arrives? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Paul's letting the church in Thessalon Thessalonica know how much he longs to be with them and how much he loves them. There may have been attacks on Paul's character that accused him of not caring, but here he is setting the record straight. They had been separated, torn apart, literally orphaned from the church in Thessalonica. As a matter of fact, the Greek word from, that, that is used here is got orphan in the name. It's where we get the English word orphan from. It refers to being deprived, being bereaved, being made an orphan. And this word combines the separation with the mental anguish, the mental anxiety that results from the separation. It includes not just the situation, but also the emotional distress that comes along with it. So Paul may have been referring to the way he was suddenly forced to leave when he planted the church. As a matter of fact, it's likely that's what he was referring to. In Acts chapter 17, verse 5 to 10, we see how Paul's ministry in Thessalonica ended rather abruptly. But other Jews were jealous. Some had come to faith, but other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They're all defying Caesar's decree, saying there's another king, one called Jesus. Pretty serious sedition. When they heard this, a crowd and city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea, and thus Paul was suddenly orphaned. He was taken away under cover of night quickly because of the tension and because of the problems. You need to go. You need to go now. And he wasn't ready to go, and he felt separated. He felt like an orphan because he was separated from the church fellowship. Furthermore, Paul states that Satan blocked his way from seeing them again. Not only is he taken away, but he's made attempts, and he cannot get back maybe even from Berea, initially. Satan is a real adversary working against the cause of the gospel, the cause of the discipleship, and the cause of fellowship. Do you know that Satan doesn't want us to meet together? He doesn't want us to be encouraged in the fellowship. He wants us separated. He wants us isolated because a predator ticks off its prey by separating those that are weak and are vulnerable. In Ephesians 6.12, it says, For a struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Whether it was through opposition from civil authorities in Thessalonica, local Jewish opposition, travel complications, illness, maybe COVID-1, I don't know, or a combination of factors, Satan was at work in keeping them apart. He did not want them to be together, and Paul was missing the fellowship of this church. Being separated and not knowing how to connect can be painful. How many of you, when we went through that time, when it started in, in March of this last year, 
and we were separated. They said, you cannot meet. You cannot be together. How many of you felt a little bit of separation anxiety? You felt the loneliness. You felt the isolation. How many of you concerned that it could happen again? <laughs> At least that's what's being threatened. Well, I think we can understand exactly how Paul feels with the thought of, I can't be there. I can't be there in fellowship. I'm concerned about how they're doing spiritually. I can't be in their presence. How are they doing? What's going to happen? And I'm forcibly separated. I think we can uniquely understand in our current situation a little how Paul might have felt. Who were the Thessalonians to Paul? Well, they're his family. And they're a responsibility. He cares about them. He knows he's supposed to nurture them. How do you do that when you can't be with them? Paul is thinking about them both in future terms and in present terms. In future terms, he was thinking of when we see Jesus face to face. In 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 19, he says, For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus? When he comes, when he arrives, is it not you? And he's thinking of that day when Jesus is is going, he's going to be with you. He's going to see Jesus face to face. Whether it be a rapture or his death, he's going to see Jesus face to face. He's going to give an account He's going to give an account of how he interacted with the Thessalonians. And he's thinking about that. He's thinking about that day when his work is going to be judged. Paul is anticipating the Lord's return for his people. When he comes, is literally at his coming. Parousia is the Greek word that is used. The idea of arrival and advent. And this can refer to his coming at the end of the tribulation to set up the millennial reign, what we call his second coming. Or it can refer to his coming at the rapture. In this case, I believe it is referring to the rapture. And the reason I think that is because in another con- the larger context of 1 Thessalonians, just 29 verses later, he mentions the parousia again, and he mentions it in reference of, of, of a rapture. And plus, he, he knows that he might, it might happen at any time. You kind of get the idea that it could happen at any time, which fits the rapture. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 to 17, he wrote, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive... You notice he says we. He thinks that could happen for him. He didn't know when Jesus would come back. It could happen any moment. Who are left until the coming of the Lord. There's that word parousia again, the Greek. Same word, and it's used in the context of the rapture. Will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's going to be kind of exciting, isn't it? After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together. That's the Greek word harpazo. It's where we get the Latin word rapture from. Caught up, snatched away hastily. Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and we'll go to be with him. And so we'll be with the Lord forever. So when Jesus returns for his people, whether by rapture or by death, we are going to give an account of our work. Paul's going to give an account of his work. His work is going to be evaluated. And this has the Bema seat judgment in view. At the Bema seat, the believer's work will be evaluated. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not a salvation issue. All believers pass out of condemnation and into eternal life based on Jesus' work on the cross on their behalf. It's based on him alone, his work alone, by faith alone. Grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. All believers pass out of condemnation. This is not a salvation issue. This is not a judgment issue. In John 5, 24, Jesus even said, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged or condemned. He's crossed over from death to life. So if you're following Jesus, you are saved. It's not a salvation issue. That will never be judged. You've crossed over from death to life. You are not going to be under condemnation. But there is a judgment of each believer's work at the Bema judgment. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, in the context clearly talking to believers, Paul wrote, for we, he put himself in there, must all appear before the judgment seat. That's Bema for seat. The Bema of Christ. Now, there's going to be a judgment that comes at the end of the millennium after the thousand-year reign. Revelation 20, verse 11 to 15 talks about that's a great white throne judgment. That's a judgment of unbelievers. We don't want to be there because that does not end well. But for the Bema seat judgment, that's evaluating our work when we see Jesus face to face. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So it's looking at the issue of rewards. 
Now, in our passage, Paul envisions Jesus evaluating his ministry work. He is in the presence of Jesus, giving an account, and including in that account is how he has interacted with the Thessalonians, how the Thessalonians have grown, and the work that has been done. So we need to realize that our work will be evaluated. Our gifts and talents and how we use them will be evaluated. What is your work for the Lord? What are your gifts and talents? Are you hiding your talents or are you putting them to good use? Now, this is important because we live in a consumer mentality in the U.S., and we need to ask ourselves if we're using our talents to glorify his name so we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And that could be amazing if you stand before Jesus and he looks at you and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't think there'll be a dry eye that comes across that situation or that time. That's going to be a powerful time. I want to hear that. So where are you at in this? Because it's an important question. If you're a sincere follower of Jesus, your salvation is not in question. But if the Apostle Paul was thinking about standing before Jesus to give an account of how he used his talents, then there's something here for all of us to think about. So in future terms, he's thinking about standing before Jesus, giving an account of his relationship with the Thessalonian church and what took place there. In present terms, Paul is boasting or glorying in what God has done. As a matter of fact, in verse 20, it says, Indeed, you are our glory and joy in the present tense as well. And this isn't about Paul's glory. It's about God's glory. What he's looking at is is there's a joy that comes when he sees the fruit of the ministry, the hope that he's put into ministry. And and he can glorify God through what has taken place. And he's giving the glory to God, but he's excited about the glory that comes to God through his ministry. We know he's not boasting. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 28 to 31, the apostle Paul wrote, God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, it's written Jeremiah 9, 24, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so what Paul is doing, he's looking then, he says, look at the fruit that God has borne as a result of the ministry and as a result of the work and what he has produced. And it's glorifying him and there's joy in, in rejoicing in what's taking place in the Thessalonians as their faith has grown and as people have come to Christ. What is it the Thessalonian church means to Paul as he presents his work to Christ? Well, in verse 19, he says, what is our hope, our joy, or the crown? And later he says, is it not you? They are, the Thessalonians are his hope. They are the objects of his hopes for fruitful ministry, that his fruit will bear work, that he'll have something to present to Jesus of great value to Jesus. And they are his joy. There's a cause for joy. There's joy when a hope is realized. Imagine a farmer who plants a crop. He plants it. It's really important to him. He needs the crop to, to have for the harvest. He waters it, nurtures it, do whatever he can. And there's a hope, there's an anticipation that it's going to bear fruit. And when the fruit is harvested, there is joy. There is a celebration. Well, the Thessalonians' faith and salvation are a great reason to rejoice, even in the present for the Apostle Paul. They are his crown. Now, in the Greek, the crown here is the Stephanos crown, the wreath given to victors in the public games. The Thessalonian church is his cause for hope and joy as he finishes the race for Jesus and he receives the victor's crown for a race that is well run. Paul longs to be with them. He cares about them. He has sacrificed for them. And the enemy is attacking to keep them in part. But in no way has he forgotten about the Thessalonian church. As a pastor, I have shed some blood, sweat, and tears over ministry. Maybe not so much the blood, literally, but the the sweat and tears, probably, literally. You have often been the source of that as a church body because I care and you're also my hope joy and crown that we will present to Jesus something of great value your salvation is of great value to Jesus your discipleship is of great value to him your worship and service are of great value to him you are of great value to him and for that you're of great value to me And your discipleship and your worship and your service is of great value to me. And I hope it is to you as we present something worthwhile to Jesus that glorifies him. But Paul could not be present. He wasn't able to be there. He was separated from the fellowship. 
Satan had blocked his way to go back. So what did he do? I think it's instructive. You know, when you go through passages of, of Scripture, like what we see here, you think about, at least I think about, how well it fits with, with what we're going through. You know, if, if I would have done this passage two years ago, it would have been hard to preach, to be really honest to you. It would have been very, very difficult. And the reason it would have been difficult, it's like, well, how do you apply that? We have so much freedom in this, this area. The fellowship, it's, there's so much freedom. But we don't anymore. There's a concern about a lockdown. We went through a lockdown. We weren't able to be in fellowship. We understand how Paul feels. Since Paul could not be present, what did he do? 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 to 5, it says, so when we could stand it no longer. He's going to talk about not being able to stand any longer twice here. When we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy. You know, when he's talking about we, he's talking about Paul, he's talking about himself. He's talking about Silas, he's talking about Timothy and probably Luke. That's probably the mission team. And Timothy is dear son in the faith. And when he can't stand any longer, he's going to send Timothy. And when he sends Timothy, he's sending someone who's very important to him. So we can stand it no longer. We thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We send Timothy, who is one, our brother, and two, co-worker in God's service and spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer. I love these ways, which is from we to I. I just couldn't stand it any longer. I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid. What's he afraid of? I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. He's afraid that somehow Satan's come in and he's tempted you, and as a result, their faith may be shipwrecked. So what is Paul's response to the separation? Well, there's several things. One of the things is to send Timothy. And this is an important principle in ministry. We do not serve alone. We are co-workers. And if we can't be there, we can send someone in our place who can. You know, in our church, we have a care team. Pastor Tad is a part of that care team. Pastor Nathan's part of the care team. I'm a part of the care team, although they do a lot more work as far as organizing it. And then we have people in the church body a part of the care team. What I love about the care team is that since this church has a lot of different things going on and we can't get to everything and we can't meet all the pastoral needs that are there, we need to do it together as co-workers. And the care team is an extension of pastoral staff and is an extension of myself. When they go to the hospital, which I wish we could do, we can't do right now, but when they go to the hospital, when, when they go do a visit, when, when they pray with someone, it's an extension of me going. And when I go, it's an extension of them because we're in this together. We are co-workers in ministry. We also had a call team during the shutdown. I love the call team. I love the fact that we had all these things going on and we don't know who's hurting in what way. And so we had a call team calling different people, finding out where are the greatest needs. Who should we be praying for? What needs do we need to address? And just caring for the church body. And as they went, I went as an extension of me and I was an extension of them. When Paul wanted to be there but couldn't, he would often send Timothy as an extension of himself. He had sent Timothy to encourage and strengthen believers in Corinth, in Ephesus, in Philippi, and here in Thessalonica. Notice he did not just send anyone, he sent Timothy. He sent the best and dearest representative he had available. Timothy is a brother, a sincere follower of Jesus. A necessary requirement of anyone we send is that they are a sincere follower of Jesus, that they have the same heart for God that we have, and Timothy had the same heart for God that Paul had. He also is called a co-worker in our text, in God's service. He was Paul's representative serving God's interest and not his own. He went to serve the church body with the same heart for the church body that Paul had. And we need to send people who have the same heart for the church body that we do. You know, a shepherd doesn't send a wolf to care for the sheep. Timothy was sent for the purpose of strengthening them in the faith. He had the same heart as Paul did for the mission. When my nephew went to college at Boise State University, 
I want to do what I could to strengthen him in his faith. And we met here in Washougal, and I was to drive him to Boise State University. And on the drive out there, he had so many questions about Scripture. His uncle Rich, he goes, you're a pastor, and I know you like apologetics and all that kind of stuff. Can you answer some questions? And the entire time down, he just drilled me with questions. And that night when we got there, I stayed there overnight, and I was leaving the next day, and we just talked about God the entire time. He was so hungry to know more and to, and to grow in his faith. And then I had to leave him there with liberal professors and people who did not necessarily have his best interest in mind nor his spiritual maturity in mind. So I asked him if when I got home I could call a couple campus ministries and have them stop by to see him. And he said that would be great. So when I got home, I called a couple of those ministries and gave them his name and his dorm number. I talked with some of these campus ministry leaders and they were faithful to follow up. He got involved in those ministries, and even now, although he's transferred to another school in Florida, he is active in ministry and growing in his faith. They had the same heart that I did to see him grow and to see him mature. I couldn't physically be there for him, but I was able to send someone who could. I sent someone to encourage and strengthen them in the faith. The point being, we are not alone in this. We are not alone. God has given us the larger church body. It's not a competition. We're co-workers. Even other churches that are Bible-believing churches, it's not a competition. It's cooperation to help people grow in the faith. And he's given us amazing resources. He's given us social media and texting and prayer. And can we use those tools to help others? Paul was writing a letter sent by Timothy. He was sending Timothy. He was using resources. He was praying. He was showing concern. He was doing whatever he could do in this separation to bless these people, to help them, to encourage them in the faith and protect them. Who is in your care? Who has God entrusted you to care for? It could be a child. It could be a grandchild. It could be a coworker. It could be a friend. It could be a fellow student. Whom has God given to you? You may not be a pastor with a congregation to be concerned about, but what are you doing to make sure your children and your grandchildren and your relatives and your neighbors and your coworkers and fellow students and friends know the person of Jesus? One of my great concerns is how flippant the church can be about eternal matters. So often we're pressured to one more school activity, one more soccer team, one more event. We get caught up in the world's priorities and seeking approval by the world and we let the eternal destinies of loved ones slide like it's not that important. It's certainly not as important as this worldly activity that's going on and Jesus slips in priorities to the point where maybe he's not a priority at all. You know, I've had too many times when a parent's come to me in a panic. You know, their child says they don't believe in Jesus anymore. They don't think the faith is true. We, they were raised in a Christian home. How could they think this way? And sometimes it's really tragic because the, they did everything right and it still happens. But sometimes there's people who come and they say, why did this happen, Pastor? We're a Christian family. They're not following in our tradition. I don't say it, but I'm thinking, and you've been to church five times this year. And they're involved in all these activities. And even as I asked them, well, how often do you pray together? How often do you bring up Christ? Well, they don't. But we're Christian. It's like, well, what you've basically done, I don't tell them this, but I'm thinking, is you've trained them to make Jesus the lowest priority. You've trained them to think that Jesus is unimportant. Because evidently he is. So if you feel like the priority of Jesus is becoming lower and lower and lower, you know what one good thing about COVID is? It's, it, it sets up a good restart, right? It's a, good, it's a good restart. It's a good reset for our priorities. Because I'm hoping and praying someday we open back up again. And when we do, the world will flood in with all these activities that you can do. And with all those activities, then Jesus will be lowered and lowered and lowered to a smaller and smaller priority. And I hope one thing we learn from this is that he needs to be highest priority. And he's put as a highest priority, and he stays as highest priority. Because you want to know something? I've been a pastor for a while now. I've been a lot of people at their deathbed. I have yet to have one person say, Pastor, I wish I would have played on one more soccer team. Never happened. Not even close. It's usually, I wish I would have invested more in godly things. I wish I would have known Jesus better. I wish I would have impressed this upon my children. I hear that a lot. 
I've never heard one person say, boy, I wish I had played one more basketball game. I wish I would have played one more soccer team. I wish I had been involved in one more worldly event. It never happened. So how is it when we die that when we understand what is most important, when it's at the end of our life, that all of a sudden we commit to a higher priority in Jesus? Let's make sure our priorities are right and that Jesus is highest priority now. We need to prepare our loved ones and people God places in our path for the trials that will come, and they will come. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3 to 4, Paul had sent Timothy to strengthen the Thessalonians in faith. He said, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we're destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. Trials and persecution will come. We're actually promised that. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. John 16.33, Jesus said, In this world you will have trouble. It doesn't say you may have trouble, you will have trouble. How many have had some trouble in this world? If you're not currently experiencing trouble, you will very soon. There's a lot of trouble in this world. But Jesus says, But take heart, I have overcome the world. And we understand that both God and Satan work in trials. Paul said, you know, Satan's prevented us. I'm fearful of what he might have done in tempting you. But God works in trials too. Now God's goal in trials is that we become more like Christ. James 1, 2 to 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. He wants to make you mature through trials. He wants you to become more Christ-like. He's growing us in trials. God does not always take away the trial. He doesn't always take away the suffering. We want him to. I want him to. But he doesn't always take it away, but he does get us through it. He does work, us, work it uh, so that we're growing. He walks with us through it. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. In, in Acts chapter 7, verse 55 to 56, I find some of, these, some of, this, the, the, most, some of the most uh, fascinating scriptures in all the Bible. We have Stephen. Uh, the, he's an evangelist. He was one of the deacons in Acts chapter 6, a godly man, and he's about to die for his faith. Matter of fact, Apostle Paul's going to be there helping the whole thing take place. He's about to die for his faith. He's going to be stoned to death. And in the process of that, it says, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Notice Jesus is standing. Look, he said, I've seen heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And that's unusual because throughout Scripture, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. And the reason he's sitting is because when a representative of the king went and did his job and he did it well, he'd come back and he'd sit because it was done, it was complete. And then he's at the right hand of God, shows his position of authority as Son of God. He's sitting down because he's finished his work. In Hebrews 1.3, it talks about how Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God after he's done everything for us. But in our passage... In the, at the stoning of Stephen, he's standing, and you stand to act. So he's going to act. Well, what did he do? Stephen still died. But he helped him through the trial and welcomed him on the other side. And today, he still helps us through the trials. He may not take us out of the trial, but he will hold us as his child through the trial and get us where we need to be. Eliza Morgan is the former CEO of MOPS, Mothers of Preschool, Preschoolers International. When her daughter Ava was 11 years old, Eliza was tucking her into bed one night while Ava got ready to say her evening prayers. Eliza told her about a friend's teenage daughter whose hair was mysteriously falling out and encouraged Ava to pray for Amy. And her simple prayer was, Jesus, please hold Amy's hair on her head. Jesus, please hold Amy's hair on her head. As the doctors experimented with different treatments, Amy continued to lose hair, and Ava continued to pray the same prayer every night, Jesus, please hold Amy's hair on her head. After six weeks, Amy was diagnosed with alopecia, a rare disorder where hair loss is unpredictable but can be complete and permanent. When Ava heard this, she prayed, Dear Jesus, if you won't hold Amy's hair on her head, would you please hold Amy? And that kind of says it in a nutshell. Sometimes we just need to be held through it, and Jesus will hold us through it. God is present in our grief. He may not always remove the trial, but he can hold us through it, and his intent is always that we become more like Jesus. 
God works in trials. But you want to know something? Satan is real, and he works in trials too. He works to tempt you and snatch away the truth of God's word. He wants to devour you. He wants to devour your loved ones. In Matthew 13, verse 18 to 19, Jesus said, Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is a seed sown along the path. 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9, it says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith. He's a very real enemy, and we are in a very real spiritual battle. And we must know God's word and be armed with spiritual armor to stand firm in the faith. And the idea of standing firm is mentioned four times in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 to 14, that famous passage on the spiritual armor of God. We will be tempted. Hardship and trial will come. You may be in a trial right now. You often are, I am sure, of some kind or another. Well, Satan even tempted Jesus in the desert. In Matthew 4, verse 1 to 11, the Holy Spirit takes Jesus away to the desert where he doesn't eat for 40 days. He's hungry. You could say it's a form of trial. Satan comes to tempt him. And Jesus responded with the truth of God's word again and again. And when he went through another trial in the Garden of Gethsemane, he did it again. He's praying. He's going to the Father. He's trusting in him. We should use his word as well and go to the Father. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5, it says, For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I love Paul's pain in this, I sent to find out about your faith. He's freaking out a little bit about their faith and what might be happening. I was afraid that in some way the tempter, that's what he calls them, had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. In other words, this is too precious. We can't lose this. We can't lose this to the enemy. So this is not a time for inactivity. I don't know what's going to happen this week. I don't know what they're going to try to shut down, what they're not going to try to shut down, but they can't shut down the fellowship of God. They can't shut down your heart for Jesus. They can't shut down your work for Jesus, and how you can help someone who might be hurting. It's not a time for an activity. A predator is on the loose. He is active, and so we must be as well. You know, if there were a lion walking the streets of Washougal picking people off, and you knew that, you'd probably look a little bit more when you went out in the streets. Be aware of that predator. You might keep your children a little bit closer to you. We have a predator who's actually more dangerous You know, Pastor Nathan sends out emails to staff of pedophiles who register when they enter the area. The safety team and various leaders are alerted for the safety of our children. That's what we do when we know there's a threat. We're on alert. We're standing guard. We're prepared. Are we prepared for the spiritual battle and a spiritual enemy? We need to show concern and protect the weak and vulnerable from the worst predator of all, the demonic. You know what? The demonic is very active. He's active in social media. The demonic, our satanic influence is is active in government. He's active in media. He's active on TV shows. He's active in schools. And so we must be active as well. Paul was concerned for the church in Thessalonica. Even in physical absence, he could pray. He could send others to help. He could write to them about God's truths and protect them from the enemy. He saw them as his hope, his joy, his crown when he would see Jesus face to face. And he could point to his work that brought people to know Jesus, live for Jesus, and please Jesus. So whom has God God given you to care for? Who is in your charge, spiritually speaking? Are we protecting them from the enemy and making of greatest importance, of highest importance, the person of Jesus and their spiritual growth? Because it's important. Again, on deathbeds, never heard, Wish I would have played one more, one more, wish I would have been in one more soccer team. Never heard it. Are we presenting Jesus to the world or are we just worldly? The worst separation anxiety will be when we lose one of these precious loved ones for an eternity. So enter the fight, use your gifts, and show your love. It's important. I don't know what's going to happen in the days ahead. 
but it's not going to change what we should be doing. So let's keep that in mind. Whatever happens, we stand for Jesus, who's highest priority. If things open up, Jesus is our highest priority. If things shut down, Jesus is our high pro- highest priority. And we enter this battle because there's a lot at stake. Now, you may be here, and you may be thinking, well, he's talking a lot about Jesus, and, and maybe you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. Why is this so important? Because eternity is at stake. God created us to be in a relationship with him for an eternity. He wants to be in a relationship with you. He wants to be one with you. But our sin separates us from a holy God. It has nothing to do with sin. He can't stand sin. It's an abomination to him. And sin isn't going to be removed by human effort. I can't be good enough. That's why Jesus went to the cross. It's an affront to the cross to say, well, I don't really need it. Jesus didn't go to the cross for the fun of it. He went to the cross because you needed it. I needed it. Paying the price for our sin, Jesus died on that cross and he rose again. Everyone puts their faith and trust in him as eternal life, life that begins now and lasts forever. And if you have yet to personally invite Jesus into your life, accepting the gift of salvation he's given through the cross, I'm just going to ask you to do it now. I'm going to pray, closing prayer as I, I always do, giving an opportunity to respond. And if you're here and you've yet to personally put your faith in Jesus, Prayer is just one way to communicate it. There's no magical incantation. It's it's not about a prayer. It's about a relationship with Jesus, about the work of Jesus on the cross. And if you haven't personally done so, this is an opportunity that God is presenting. And he says, I'm giving you this. Please take it. And if you're ready to take it, pray along with me right now. Jesus, thank you for dying in my place on the cross. Thank you for shedding your precious blood for me, for my sin. I need you. I want you. I receive you as my Savior. I will follow you as my Lord. And I trust you that today I am your child and I always will be. You indwell me with the Holy Spirit and I ask that you use my life that other people would see you in me, that you'd use my life to glorify you. This I pray in your name, the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Would you stand with me in closing? And as I do that, I think they're all here first service, although I see Tim back there. So I'm going to ask, uh, there's a few people that are joining us in, in, in uh, membership, in new members. And I'm going to mention them by name. One joined us online in the first service, and that was Linda McMahon. And they were also here first service, all of them, except for, for, for Tim was here first service, but he wasn't up front. So I had Deborah Benson come up, and Jeff Hansen come up, and Cynthia Wilson. And if any of them happen to be back second service, they can come up. Tim, why don't you come up here? They'll know who you are. You kind of probably already know who he is. Uh, he's the one I know who is here. And he wasn't up here first service. I just wanted up because I want you to know who they are. So I don't have everyone else there, but this is, this is Tim. If you haven't met Tim, he's an amazing brother. This guy pumps me up, unbelievably pumps me up. So you do, you do. Um, so I'm, I just want to pray for him, and I pray for the others. And the reason I have him up, I mention it, is say hi. We can't do the regular right hand of fellowship because we're in COVID, and we're not going to do that because I'll probably go to prison for that, let alone something else. So... Uh, so we're, we're just going we're gonna to pray and, 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 and go from there. So, Father, I want to thank you very much. I thank you for this church body. And I do pray that, that we would take very seriously the calling upon our lives that you've given us in a world. This is our time in a world that is hurting. And I ask that you'd open doors and you make fertile soil for us to be able to be minister in a great way in the world around us. And I thank you for those who have joined us in membership. I thank you for those here. There's people in this church body who really are members, who've never became members. They don't even believe in membership. And that's okay. They're part of the church family. But I thank you for those who have come forward in, in membership. I thank you for Deborah Benson, for Jeff Hansen, for Linda McMahon, for Cynthia Wilson, Wilson, and right here, our brother Tim, Tim Neal. And I thank you for them. And I ask that we would be a blessing to them. And, and Father, that we would encourage them to faith and we'd strengthen faith and we would be a family to them. And, and, and at every turn, Father, whether it's challenging them or uh, exhorting them to do something better or different or whatever it is you call us to do, we want to be an encouragement and a blessing every step of the way, a support and encouragement to them. 
uh, as, as they go forward in ministry, as they go forward in their walk with you. And I pray that for Tim, who's standing right next. I think of what he's already, you've already done in his life. I pray that you multiply what you've already done in his life in the days ahead. And I pray that for me, and I pray that for all of us, that you would continue to grow us and strengthen us because the world out there is not real friendly, but we can be kind, we can be loving, we can be gracious, we can be bold, we can hold out the word of truth, we can hold out the truth of a God who loves people in a world that is decaying and dying right in front of our eyes. Use us, we pray, to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming today. Let's go in peace.